Hey everybody, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for participating today. My name is Nick Smith. I am a correspondent here at News Nation. And just so you all know, I too am a veteran of the United States Army, did six years. Um, I am uh, happy to say that that is one of the best decisions I ever made. Uh, but it has also allowed me to uh, work with different people throughout my career um, who have served and who have not served, who have also uh, appointed me in the direction of different organizations that help uh, those who have separated from the military, uh, so post-military career. So I just want to thank each of you for taking the time to meet with us today to talk about a very important topic, uh, which is uh, veteran suicide prevention um, and what we can do to possibly either raise awareness or uh, work with those who may be struggling and helping them to access help. So feel free to jump in and know that this is indeed a safe space uh, we just want to make sure that we have an opportunity to share what you're comfortable sharing um, and hopefully that information will help others. By a show of hands, how many of you here have actually served? And how many of you know somebody dealing with PTSD? Wow, I'm looking at that and I'm looking at a monitor here, you guys. Okay, how many of you are dealing with it yourselves? Again, thank you uh, for being here and sharing that with us. Who here is a volunteer or a professional working in this field and in this space? We're all familiar with the subject. This is fantastic. And how many are both a vet and now working or volunteering in this space? All right. Let me ask this, who here has lost someone um, to maybe serious a suicide? And I, I want to talk to a couple of you um, and just actually ask you to share your uh, veteran stories. I, sh I shared with you uh, that I was a veteran. I did my basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina a long time ago. I think half of you are probably still in grade school, uh, so don't let the trick lighting fool you. Uh, but I did my uh, basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and then I went to Kaiserslautern, Germany with the 81st ATC. Um, and came back a little bit at Fort Hood, and then uh, Fort Ben Harrison, and then got out and used my GI Bill for my undergrad. Um, I can tell you that, again, that really helped to like, uh, help me solidify what it is that I wanted to do, and, and I learned that in the military, and I've used and applied many of those skills in everything that I do uh, today. But I do want to jump in there and talk, ask some of you about your stories. Uh, uh, I'm going to start with you, Charles. Charles uh, Liversedge, uh, let me talk to you about your uh, story. And if you don't mind, share with me, um, uh, I know that you were in the service for 20 years, and you said that uh, people gravitated to you naturally. Why do you think people found it easy that they could talk to you about things uh, that they could not talk to others about? You know, I didn't, I, I, I didn't, I didn't judge. If you made a mistake, you made a mistake. But people came to me with, with whatever the situation it was something good something bad they just like sharing things with me and i would uh take the time to listen and i wouldn't tell them what to do i would just kind of tell them you know if i was going through what you're going through this is maybe how i would have dr ravley you and i were speaking earlier you were working with someone who was uh who had been diagnosed uh, with cancer um, and you didn't understand at the time that their situation uh, was clearly much more personal and desperate than it appeared to be. Do you mind picking up with that for us, please? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, he was, uh, he had a great support group. Um, he was consistently in our legion. He was a Vietnam era vet and um, it just took everybody by surprise. He went to uh, his doctor's appointment. He, we, everyone knew he had cancer. Um, and unfortunately, he decided to go to the cemetery and um, commit suicide. Um, and it, it, you know, it was, um, it took everyone by surprise because we were doing what we thought were the right things, you know, within the community. And sometimes you just don't know what that breaking point is. And that's one of the things with um, our Be The One campaign with the North Country Veterans Suicide Coalition, with our partnership with the VFW and other agencies, we're trying to find ways to 
educate, um, find those underlying indicators so that um, we can stop this, this epidemic from, from continuing. Ryan Ross, I want to uh, talk to you. Ryan, can you show me your hand there? And Danny. Snacky. Okay, Ryan. Hey, both of you are vets who participated in the Sheepdog Impact Services, uh, which helps to provide mental wellness uh, to, to different groups. It's important to me because their motto is get off the couch. Um, you have a lot of veterans who and service members who get out and um, they just get lazy. You know, <laughs> you're, you're not having to do PT anymore and you just kind of get away from that day-to-day -day mundane military uh, drive that you had. Um, you know, for myself, I got when I retired, um, I did a little over 20 years in the Army. Um, I put on 40 pounds in the first two years, you know. Um, and uh, long story short, um, six months after I retired, the wife said, you need to do something, you need to get out of the house. She wasn't used to me being home. Um, I joined the local fire department, and uh, Lisa and Greg, who run the chapter here in western Wisconsin for Sheepdog, um, you know, Lisa was my sergeant major when I was in Iraq, so... Um, she got a hold of me and said, hey, join Sheepdog. I'm like, what's it about? And um, she explained that, you know, it's about for veterans and first responders and, you know, getting off the couch, getting involved, just getting back, um, doing things outside of your home. Just You know, the, the probability of having those organic connections um, goes up exponentially when you put yourself out there in front of other vets. Um, you know, it, it, it can't be forced, right? Like, I think these connections are all super organic and, and very important. So there's these shared experiences that we, we do get to, you know, connect on is really what I view as the catalyst that has helped me turn around my, how I deal with my PTSD. Um, you know, we need something to aim at um, for lack of a better term and, and, and really just the, the connections and the events and the, and the activities and stuff that Sheepdog has, uh, has really uh, provided the opportunity for has been, uh, just remarkable, honestly. And uh, I, I just, my prayer is that other vets would find organizations like these. Jessica, I want to talk to you about the suicide prevention uh, and that program. As a program manager, you said this is a population which uh, I believe is unfairly misunderstood. What does that mean? Well, I just feel like there's a lot of misconceptions regarding the veteran population. I know prior to working with that population, I had misconceptions. For example, I thought every veteran was able to get benefits from the VA and they were able to get help through the VA and all these other things, which finding out that's actually not true. So just certain things like that. And Jessica, and, not only not that, only because that, I yeah. want you to continue with that, this is a conversation I've had with friends. You also need to have both the tenacity and the will to try to navigate that system. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, especially if you're not really sure where to go, right? Um, it can be a struggle to even get that treatment or that help that you're needing. So if you're not really sure where to look to or where to turn to, you're not, you're gonna be missing out all these benefits and all these things that you can receive. Jessica, thank you so much. Dr. Blake Harris, I know that you're a licensed clinical forensic psychologist um, and you're working with at-risk patients and now you deal with high-risk patients that are uh, also um, having challenges with just getting through uh, and communicating their feelings. How do you approach that and, and how do you um, uh, approach it in a way that does not uh, make them apprehensive and uh, still receptive to the care? A very good question. You know, as some of the other panelists were talking earlier, <clears throat> it's important that there's always an opportunity for veterans to talk to other veterans because of that shared experience. It gets through a lot of the static. It can jumpstart their conversations that lead to uh, getting assistance. One of the things you also have to have, though, are mental health professionals that are military culturally competent. Mm -hmm. And it comes with training the professionals that may be working with veterans on the unique needs, the unique uh, protective factors, um, knowing um, about how military service can affect someone, you know, knowing about that transition period, and really educating yourself. And so Dr. Today, Harris, it's, it's also true too that different services um, are more robust and available in certain areas uh, than others. You know, 254 counties alone in Texas, most of it are designated as rural. So not everybody has access to a VA clinic anywhere near them. There are also issues with mobility. There are also issues with post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and all these other things that can impact someone's ability to 
remember the appointment that they have scheduled eight weeks from now and getting there. So we have to work very closely with local partners uh, at the community level, and that includes uh, working with organizations, the Veteran County Service Officers, also working with the VFW uh, mm -hmm. and the American Legion and other partners so that we can have those folks um, recognize veterans that may be struggling, equip them with uh, suicide gatekeeping training and how they can recognize signs and symptoms and know what to do and how to get veterans in touch with services in the, in the community. We also know at the national level, there's a shortage of mental health professionals. So we have to really leverage all sorts of community opportunities to include working with uh, faith-based communities. So and we know that people in the military may be coming uh, more likely to go to a chaplain than they would be to a, a mental health professional. So leaning into all of those opportunities and really trying to make sure that there is no wrong door. And strengthen local services because we also know that those seeking help more often than not will turn to their local communities uh, before they uh, go to a national level. So we have to also make sure that we uh, strengthen those partnerships as well. Dr. Harris, thank you so much. I do want to turn to you, A.B. Bustos. I know that you've uh, been working with the Homeless Veteran Program, uh, that you are one of the program managers. And as a large part of what you do starts with making those resources available. Uh, how are you doing that uh, with the homeless population? So with the homeless population here in Texas, uh, we've been doing that through force multiplying through our peer service coordinators uh, with our military veteran peer network, uh, advising them on how to best enter the um, housing system. Because a lot of times you are hard pressed to find <clears throat> exactly how to enter the housing system and how to enroll into a housing program, especially if um, we participate in the coordinated assessment and coordinated entry. And so finding those sites that allow you to do the coordinated assessment, coordinated entry can be kind of tricky, especially if you're not completely sure about the language when you look it up. Uh, so just ensuring that our peer service coordinators um, who are across the state of Texas understand the coordinated entry process and know in their area where to go um, and other resources that can help support housing stability like employment, uh, mental health, substance abuse uh, programs, and uh, getting them the basics, uh, just like food and stuff like that. And then, A.B., I'm also thinking, please, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're also and sometimes dealing with a, a client who may or may not be receptive to that help. Absolutely. Um, that's one big thing is we need to meet the veterans where they are. Um, so everybody on their journey is in their own uh, kind of spot. And so you need to meet them where they are, not where you expect them to be and not where you want them to be. So giving them resources that they'll be most receptive to at the time um, is a big part of ensuring that those resources are efficient and work for them um, and the continued support throughout their journey um, and seeing them as an individual and not just a client that you have on your caseload. A.B., thank you so much for that. Uh, Candace uh, Christ, I want to turn to you. Um, you, uh, you work with Journey to the Light Ministries in Wisconsin. We were just talking about how important faith-based organizations can be in the process of healing and dealing with those who are struggling. You started navigating the system with your father, who was a Vietnam veteran himself, and now you help vets across the state of Wisconsin. Why is it necessary? What are the programs in Wisconsin that are state funded lacking um, where you all seem to uh, pick up the slack or fill in the missing pieces? Well, I feel that partnership in, especially in the rural communities, travel is a big thing to get to people to the urban communities to seek the resources that they are needing. Here at Journey to the Light, we are not county bound. So we're able to mobilize and create good quality services connect them with good quality resources and warm transfer them. My dad would have thrown his hands up a long time ago to get the necessary help that he needed because sometimes it's very frustrating. Sometimes making that phone call, they're just like, oh, I'll do it and gets put to the shelf, right? So is creating that warm transfer, creating that rapport with that client and walking with them, being their advocate, not just saying, here's cold transfer, drop off. You have to start from the beginning, during, and after. And oftentimes I feel like disconnect, like there's a thousand and one different therapeutic approaches that can be used with clients. Not everybody fits 
cookie cutter shape. So that's why it was important for me to get certified as a certified military counselor is because I've seen the effects not only on my father, but also as family members and my close friend, actually the founder of Journey to Light Ministry, who unfortunately passed away last year. Can you quickly just uh, uh, button it up for us as well there? Because I'm thinking that there are often times when clients are frustrated and you understand that, that frustration isn't necessarily directed at you, but it can sometimes be thrown at you. Most definitely. Well, you can talk to my dad about that. <laughs> <laughs> so he really taught me how to handle that, right? <laughs> um, but going in in reference to, is it's not really a laughing matter because, again, we can all empathize with someone who, when frustration, when emotional is oh, yeah. a gauge, becomes a gauge and not a guide, right? So it's about, again, meeting them where they're at and then correlating that, hey, I can't personalize this. Right now, they're frustrated at the situation. They are not frustrated at me. If there's something that I can do to help, I need to understand their place and I have to meet them where they're at. Candace, thank and you so much for so that. Much I appreciate that. that. Uh, Roland Van Dusen, uh, and I know that you're there, and I want to talk to you about that because after dealing with your own struggles, it led you to become a social worker. Uh, and this is what Candace was just talking about, how important that part of the, uh, the process is, being certified. And you work in, specifically in suicide prevention and that coalition. Tell us about that journey from transitioning to civilian life to actually doing this work. Well, my transition to civilian life was pretty easy. Uh, and partially because uh, I got rejected for river patrol boats in Vietnam, and I never got to see combat. And perhaps that made uh, my ride a little easier. Uh, one of the things that I do know is that I work in this coalition that was started by the VA, facilitating them and with Dr. Gravely over there in Carthage and all. The VA has learned the hard lesson that they can't do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. They have to reach out. They have to get extra help, and that's why they're forming coalitions to uh, work together with the VA so people don't fall between the cracks. Roland, is uh, that, is that, are those part of the changes you were talking about, how um, the VA has made changes to help support uh, better mental health, that they are trying to make sure they close in those gaps? Yes, and they're not doing it by themselves. They're now working with Army counselors are working with the VFW, they're working with the Legion, they're working with grassroots organizations. Uh, Tom Neely and I uh, work, which is a, a veteran support group, volunteer. We're, we're both retired, uh, we're both veterans. One of the things that we must learn to do eventually is to work as a team with everybody that's on this program and everybody that's out there. Uh, we need to learn to share our tools. All of the people in this program have got tools in their tool belts that are fantastic and can be taught to other people. Uh, if, if people wanted to get a hold of other materials, I can, I can share with anybody that, that emails me, I can give you uh, how to get for free my Combat Stress Magazine article on reducing suicide among veterans. I can get you for free access to my video, which the VA Suicide Prevention Program sent their staff three times in five years. I can also get you for free the principles of the Warrior's Path Home, which is used by many groups down in Arizona uh, that is helping people to work in self-help groups run by veterans. Roland, can I tell you how much I appreciate being working in media, how you just threw up that sign and got that in there? Because when I tell you it's all about making sure that that information is clear for people at home, I can tell you this, we will make sure that we link that in the information at the end of this as well. So we will continue to share that information. But I love, brother, that you took the time to make a sign. And you were waiting for that moment, too. You threw that out there, Roland. I love that. Thank you so much for that. Ralph Bozella, uh, you are the commander of the Longmont, Colorado American Legion. Can you tell us about your post and what the work that they're doing? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm a, first of all, I'm a combat veteran of Vietnam, uh, was drafted in 1970, um, you know, plucked out of our, my life, and like many of us, 
all the training, training, get off of a helicopter with an 80 pound rock, so, you know, five months later and you're in, you're in, you're in a battle. I mean, it's a, it's a life changing thing. Uh, a lot, you know, a lot goes on with that. And, uh, uh, coming back from all that was the toughest part of my life. And, uh, and and one of the things that we're doing here is what Jan has talked about is the American Legion's Be the One campaign. And really what that's all about is reaching out. We're not counselors. Uh, we're not professional people, but we want to stay uh, in uh, in touch with each other. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are certain cues that we could all pick up on. Uh, when the, you, you see a veteran with uh, stressful life situations, breakup, divorce, um, uh, loss of a job, depression, and these kind of things. And you know something's going on. You see friends that you know that there's behavioral changes. Uh, they're giving things away. They're writing letters or maybe emails like, I haven't seen that before. Uh, verbal cues, you know, everything's really tough. I'm tired of life. And and when you see that stuff, we have to be the ones that reach out to say, hey, what's going on? Peter, Talk to me. I want to go ahead and jump in there with you. Peter, you, you served and talk to me about your service and why it is you believe it's important that we uh, continue to talk about the message of uh, suicide prevention and PTSD. Yeah, so I'm an Army infantry veteran. I served in Afghanistan for a year in 2011 to 2012. Um, I received a Purple Heart in Afghanistan um, for um, uh, being blown up by several IEDs, being explosions. You know, I, coming back, I suffered a PTSD and TBI. Um, you know, for a while when I came home, I didn't really think I had an issue. I just kind of thought everyone else had an issue and just didn't know how to deal with me. Um, you know, it took a while for me to really try to find someone I connected with. And finally, the person I connected with was also a veteran. And this led me into finding out what uh, peer support is. And um, with peer support, I now work with the r, &R House, which is a peer-run respite for veterans in Wisconsin. And it's really cool just to be able to um, connect with people who've gone through uh, similar experiences, but to show to um, to be able to tell your recovery story and really to show the other veterans that there is hope. Everyone's recovery is going to be different, you know. But does the end of the day to show, hey, look, this is what I've gone through, and this is what worked for me, and you know, there is hope at the end of the day. Peter, thank Peter, you so thank much. You I so appreciate much. that. It, there is indeed hope, and we need to continue, all of us collectively, pushing that message. Patricia, I saw you raise your hand, and I'm sorry about missing you earlier. I do want to go ahead and ask you the same thing. Uh, Patricia, you chose to be part of this panel today. It was important to share your message. Why? And, and, and what, what is it that has you concerned? Healing Warrior Hearts, which is the program that I founded many years ago, is a retreat program for veterans and we offer it free to all veterans and it involves both the community and the veterans. So our, our staff for every retreat is both veterans and civilians and the vets have a chance to be accepted by their peers as well as by the community. And as has been said by other folks today, community is a really important factor and giving them a place they can keep coming back to be involved in staff future retreats to give them a family. We, we call it the family of the warrior heart uh, that they can come back to and be a part of gives them that community, that sense of unit, that sense of camaraderie that many of them are missing since they come, many of them these days come home alone. Uh, Mr. Carlson, I want to go to you because I know that I missed you also earlier and I want to get a chance for you to share your story as well. Do you mind telling us why you uh, knew that it was important to uh, participate today and hopefully share the message of finding uh, resources and assistance for those who may be struggling? In 2022, 27 uh, veterans committed suicide in Ozaki County, Wisconsin. Ozaki County, Wisconsin is the most affluent county in the state of Wisconsin, and much to my surprise, the 25th most affluent county in the United States. So the, the, the problem of suicide, the problem of suicide with our veterans, the problem with the stigma around mental health, and, and mental disease not being treated as a disease, but but uh, something of, of weakness, uh, it crosses the entire boundaries geographically, uh, race, uh, any any social or economic uh, uh, position. Um, it, it is uh, everywhere, and it's a desperate need that we have. So we've chosen 
um, as uh, our Rotary unit uh, the, with the Veterans Affairs Committee that I chair to align with this organization and get the word out on resources that are available to veterans uh, across our area and then be the point of the arrow for other organizations to, to uh, work together, as Ralph was talking about, in a very cohesive manner in order to get the support and information out to the veterans that uh, so desperately need them. Diane, I want to jump in there and grab you because I know uh, one of the reasons you wanted to participate once again uh, is because your organization has been working in this space a while. Do you mind sharing with us uh, what it is you want to make sure we uh, conveyed today when we did this piece, uh, when you participated, you wanted to make sure the message sent out today was what? Well, I say you were not broke when you enlisted and you shouldn't be broke when you got out. And I found healing through Healing Warrior Hearts for military sexual trauma. And then I began to volunteer with them so that I could get forward and continue my healing. And I know for me as a Marine, it was hard to consider that I had PTSD because I had not been to combat and I associated PTSD with combat. And I learned there that we don't compare trauma trauma, different things affect us differently, and it may impact us more than others, depending on our circumstances and our history. And it, it doesn't matter. There is still hope and healing available, and you deserve it. Everybody deserves to have that healing. Diane, thank you. That is the uh, message I think we need to close out on. Everyone deserves to have that healing. Uh, again, to everyone participating this afternoon, I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, work with Marty and me and putting this together because we are each committed to making sure that we tell the stories of veterans and that we recognize the men and women who have served. I don't believe the service ends when that enlistment or uh, that time of service is over. It's a continued practice and it's a continued responsibility that we have to each other. So thanks to each of you for participating today.